Hey everybody, welcome back to Permaslug. My name is Jonathan and today's video is not an Oxygen tutorial. Instead, we're gonna be covering how to scope website design projects. This information is things that I've learned over the years trying to accurately scope out website projects. And this is not something that I'm sitting here claiming I'm an absolute expert on, but I just wanna share some tips with you, especially if you're newer as a freelancer or trying to build an agency like I still am trying to do. This stuff will hopefully help you quite a bit. So this all came about because I asked the question in the Permaslug Facebook group a couple of weeks ago. If anybody was interested in topics around pricing and sales and marketing, and there was a resounding yes. So to start that process off, I released a website design pricing survey. One of the questions was around challenges when it comes to pricing your website design builds. And primarily the focus was around scope. So most people struggle with scoping. And so what I'm hoping to share with you is just some information that I've learned over the years that will hopefully, hopefully help you scope out your website design projects more accurately. So moving in, before we get started, I wanted to just share with you, my name is Jonathan, and of course, uh, you probably know me from the Permis Like YouTube channel, but I also have a business called Apex Web Solutions, where we specifically focus on Words, WordPress website design builds. I started what would become the business in 2014, spent about two, two and a half years as a freelancer, and then started Apex Web Solutions in the beginning of 2017. So I've been doing it a number of years now, and I feel like I've really start, started to get you know my feet underneath me in the last couple of years. Part of that has been just honing in on a super niche uh, kind of specialty or, you know, a very narrow niche, which is just WordPress website design and specifically using oxygen. We don't do anything else. For the sake of our conversation today, I wanted to mention that all of these tips and kind of the things that we're going to discuss today will be implemented in various stages of your customer journey, whether that be the initial sales call, you know, maybe your second or third call through email, whatever it is. However that works for you, this is not something that is sort of a linear flow. You can kind of just implement these in whatever makes sense for your business and your kind of sales process. So for me, I basically compile all of this information in whatever medium that it comes through, and then I convert that into the contract, you know, right before the client signs. So this is all detailed very specifically in the contract, but this is what I use to come up with the pricing and how I'm going to, you know, basically quote this particular project. Like I already mentioned, I don't claim to be a scoping expert, but hopefully this will help help you. And it will basically be something that you iterate and change over time. So none of this is, you know, the absolute gold standard. You'll change it, you'll make it better. You'll comment on the video and tell me what you learned. And I'm gonna implement that in my own business. So that's why I'm trying to share this with you guys. So before discussing any details with your clients, what I personally like to do is get admin access to their WordPress website or hosting if it's not a WordPress website so that I can install both Hotjar and Google Analytics. I'm sure you're probably familiar with Google Analytics, but I look at that just to figure out what are the top pages for ideally at least the last 30 days or the last few months. And then uh, of course you can be invited to their Google Analytics if they already have that, but often the customers I'm dealing with don't. And then with Hotjar, that is a click tracking and a heat mapping tool so you can see where people move their mouse across the page. And that is really awesome because that will show you what are people trying to click on, where are they trying to get, and it often helps you dis determine the kind of organization of the content on the new website. Typically what I find is that people think they know what the top content is on their site, but the data shows a different story, which is super interesting. So if you've reviewed that ahead of time with your, you know, maybe your first kind of onboarding call with your clients or like your initial sales call, that's an extremely handy tool for you to be able to share with them. And that really resonates with clients. I find that people love that and you just look like an absolute expert. So that's really gonna help you when scoping out your website projects because you're just gonna have such accurate data on what the website needs to do and how it needs to function. Because of the way that conversations are happening these days with clients, it's typically taking place over Zoom for me, used to be in person, but one huge benefit of that is that I now record the Zoom calls and I transcribe it using rev.com. Does cost a little bit of money, but it is absolutely worth it because I often miss little nuances and details that the clients share with me. And if there's things that they say they specifically want or things that I tell them that I can do, I have that in record, you know, basically through that transcription and I share it with the client, which they really appreciate too. It's really just a helpful message memory tool for me to be able to reference back when I'm really trying to put together the scope. Next up is just some good questions to ask in your sales conversations with your clients. So what do you like and what do you not like about your current website? Usually that will be a long-winded answer that, you know, with something like your transcription, you don't necessarily have to sit there and take notes for, but as long as you're getting them to talk about their website and what they need it to do, that's going to be really helpful. So that's what these questions are designed to do. It's to get the client talking. I pretty much always ask, what do you like about your website? And what do you not like as pretty much the first two questions. 
Uh, I typically like to ask what is missing from the current site. So whether that be, you know, some some piece of downloadable information or whatever that looks like for that client. Usually they know there's something that they wish was on there but isn't currently, or sometimes it's just outdated content. You know, hours are wrong, locations are wrong, whatever, that sort of thing. Another good one to ask is who are their main competitors? So you can go take a look at what they're doing, kind of see how their site is set up, maybe do some SEO analysis if you have any kind of background in that. And then I also like to ask, what does an ideal conversion look like for them? Is there, are, are they the type of business that needs somebody to get on the phone with them so that they can convert? Do they need them to fill out a form or you know schedule an online booking? What does that look like for that client? And all that information is really going to help you compile the overarching goal of the website. So what I like to do as well is with their current website, I like to go get a page count using something like XML sitemaps. So I at least have an idea of how big their site is without having to go do that manually. Pretty sure XML sitemaps allows you to do up to 500 pages for free, and that's typically more than enough for the type of client that I'm dealing with. I also then like to go take a look at the depth of content on kind of the top level and the tier one sub pages. So what I mean by that is like, you know, if you have example.com slash whatever, like locations, then you have locations slash whatever. I like to go look at kind of those two stages. I don't go even deeper than that in their their kind of sitemap. Uh, but I do like to at least get a sense for how deep is their content. And in that same process, I also like to take a look at how dated is the content. That's going to give you a really good idea of how much of these pages are you going to be able to kind of reskin in terms of, you know, header and footer, kind of typography, colors, that sort of thing. Or are you going to have to completely restructure the whole content because of the fact that it's so outdated, they need to replace everything. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a bit of a 50-50 for me. Sometimes it's a complete restructuring of content and, you know, design. And sometimes it's just a design skin for some of those inner pages. I also like to think to myself, what can be templatized? So if they have a bunch of staff members, a lot of testimonial sliders, a bunch of locations, that's all stuff that like in an Oxygen website, you can build templates for, and that's going to save you a significant amount of time, which doesn't necessarily mean that the client should get a discount for that. But you also don't have to treat one staff member or, you know, let's say like, you know, locations as one page per location, you can templatize it. So hopefully it's a bit quicker for you to build that and, uh, you know, you can work that into the scope, factoring in how much time it's going to take you to build those templates, of course. The next thing you're going to need to work pretty closely with your client on is developing the goals for the new website. So the first step in that process is coming up with the ICP or the ideal customer profile. And there's some examples there like age, gender, physical location, etc., of who their ideal customer is. And that's really going to help you guide the website's structure, how it looks, you know, what it's supposed to do based around that ideal customer profile. And this goes back to developing the overarching goal of the website. Do they need it to make sales or collect user signups like email lists or online bookings or whatever? Those are all going to kind of work together. So how you structure the site is going to be based around the goal and the ideal customer profile. Another really important consideration is editing capabilities. Who after this new site goes live is going to be responsible for making updates and changes? Does the client even want that ability themselves? Often that I find, especially in smaller businesses, they do want the ability to post blogs or some kind of update on the site without having to necessarily wait for you, which I think a lot of clients expect that, you know, they have to go through their web designer to get those things done. But if that's something that you can work in, giving people that client editability to some degree, people really, really resonate with that. And I find that's a really popular request. People want that ability to, to do that. Kind of tying into some of the goals and, you know, website uh, functionality is building a wish list of functionality, no matter how unrealistic or how big the cost and time involved it would be to develop some of these items, I still like to work through the exercise of developing wish list functionality with the client because that's going to give me a sense for what is most important now and then also what can we iterate on over time, hopefully increasing the billable rate for your agency, but also achieving you know the end result that the client is after with this particular website just broken out over time, which is perfectly fine with me. I already covered getting their website, you know, WordPress admin credentials uh, in the hot jar kind of Google Analytics portion. So we'll move on from that. Moving into actually detailed specifications on what you should cover in your contracts or your conversations. I personally like to cover every single detail, no matter how big or how small, because that helps prevent scope creep 
And what I find is that when something that the client requests or something falls outside of the scope that you already agreed on, if you go to them and say, you know, you asked for this or I need to do this, but it's going to cost X in addition to, you know, our current, um, our current agreed upon price, then often clients are willing to say yes, which is really fantastic. So I think people have a fear to do that. But what I found is after I started covering everything in the scope document in detail, I was able to then confidently go back to the client and they were on the same page as me. There was no issues at all with them paying for that work. Typically clients are okay with that. They want you to just go ahead and do it. Every once in a while they say no, but also that's a win-win for you. You're not doing work for free. And you know, if they say yes, then you know, you're getting paid that extra rate, which is awesome. I already mentioned all of these details. I typically work into an e-sign document, which is kind of the final stage before we begin the process. So I'm not building like a scope document specifically unless they want some kind of like super detailed document, but that's very, very rare, except like in cases where you have a client that sends you an RFP, which is a different conversation entirely. RFPs are terrible. Every once in a while, they will want a scope document, but most of the time, this is me internally building this information so that I can put together the actual quote and the price. I wanted to mention as well that handshake deals are super bad for scope creep because then you have nothing to fall back on when the client says, I want to add 10 new pages to the site. You're like, well, I told you it was going to be X dollars in a flat rate program and I never specified anything about that. So I would highly, highly recommend you get away from handshake deals. Don't just use some sort of like simple note on your invoice. That's not a contract. You need something legally binding that you can enforce And sometimes it does come down to that, but that just looks professional and more professional, larger businesses will expect something legitimate like that. Moving into the nitty gritty in terms of specifications, these are some of the things that I cover in my contract every single time, which is what platform and what page builder, which I already mentioned is always WordPress and 99% of the time it's oxygen. What does the design method look like for you? I basically just write it as custom in our contracts because of course we're building an oxygen website. So technically it is a custom website. Um, you could you could call it a template, you could call it hybrid, whatever works for you. I like to define the pages that are included in the price on that that um, you know contract. So typically the minimum that we do is 10 pages. And based on the sitemap that you had from the current site, usually you'll have a pretty good indication of what new pages need to be added by this point and what can be taken away. You can use that as kind of the page count that is included in your scope document. Another thing to consider is the security component. Do you use security plugins and uh, is your hosting going to be handling the security? I basically just cover the fact that I use one security plugin and the hosting is premium, kind of like, you know, business grade hosting. So the security is handled on that side too. SSL, I typically just include Let's Encrypt with our hosting plans. So the SSL is pretty much a non-issue, but I guess you could charge for that if you wanted to. Hosting is basically giving them two options for us to host and maintain it with a bit of a maintenance plan on a monthly basis, or they can host it themselves. And they're basically just ticking the box on which one they want to do. Given the option, I would say probably three quarters of the time, 75% of the time, people just tick the box that says they want us to host it, which is fantastic because that does actually make a pretty good uh, portion of our revenue just from the hosting and maintenance plans, which is amazing. Another thing to keep in mind is if you have plugin licensing fees, like if you're using some sort of third-party plugin that costs you an annual fee, you always want to pass that on to the client, but you need to detail that because if you send them a random bill for something they've never heard of and never knew they had, never knew they needed, then it's going to be a, a bit of a you know cause for conflict when you come knocking on their door for $250 every year. But instead, if that is just detailed, then they'll know and everyone will be happy and on the same page. You can also at this point put in the optional extras section. So that goes back to the wish list functionality, that big list you made earlier, and that will help you plug in the boxes. You know, you could basically just have like a tick box in the contract. What do they want? Do they want any of it? Maybe not. That's totally fine. But you can revisit that later. As time passes, you can go back to them and say, you know that thing we discussed when we were first building the site? Are you guys ready to do that? So that wish list is a fantastic tool for you to have. I also specifically cover the e-commerce component as kind of a separate entity, even if it's not even really a part of the contract because I have had this pop up where people do expect some e-commerce component later on. And so I typically just say, is there an e-commerce component included or not? And most of the time that's no for us. How many products are you willing to set up for the client in your included fee? What is that, 10, 50, who knows? That's up to you. And then the payment gateway 
Do they need to sign up for something like Stripe? Do they need to give you their PayPal password? Whatever that is, just think about all the different components of an e-commerce build that you need to, to cover in that scope document. Some deliverables that you really need to consider are things from the client. So are they gonna be responsible for providing you text copy, photos, and logos? I think that's pretty typical. Uh, there's a whole other conversation to be had around actually getting that content out of the client, and we can touch on that. Um, some of the onboarding requirements, like for us, we do have a fillable form on the website. So as soon as they finish signing the contract, they go fill out this form, and it basically just asks all the default questions like business name, email, address, hours, stuff like that. So we have kind of a beginning stage that information is kind of um, you know compiled in one location. Is there a call that you want to schedule? Do you want to go ahead and schedule a call as kind of the first step after they sign the contract? That's up to you. Just think about the onboarding requirements, and I do put that in the scope uh, along with the deliverable deadlines. So I I have timelines on each of these things. So you know, two weeks after we sign the contract, we need kind of the basic sitemap and images compiled. After that, then it comes the text copy and photos. But as you can see in the Your Company section side, what I do is typically just fill in some stock images, put in filler text and placeholder images. Although I never show that to the client, I always get them to provide at least something because people people are very weird about lorem ipsum and filler images, I find. From the design perspective, are you building a mock-up of the site beforehand before you actually start on development, which I personally highly recommend, that's what we do. And how many rounds of revisions do they get on that mock-up? Do they basically give you the thumbs up and then you start developing the site? Or how many times do they get to say, I don't like this, I wanna tweak this tiny little thing? What we personally do is we give them one revision on the actual mock-up and then any changes after that are just implemented into the actual design, uh, excuse me, the development of the site. Then cover the de the development revisions. How many revisions do they get on the site before you start pulling your hair out and wanting to fire the client? And then also the timeline on that. How, how long before they can expect something? The sooner the better. And I typically find that most of these, these projects take four to six weeks ideally, but sometimes even as much as 90 days or more, which is really not ideal, but sometimes that's just the way it goes. So some closing thoughts is, like I already mentioned, this is going to be iterative. You're gonna change this stuff over time. Every site is different, every client is different, but if you're working in that small to medium business space, I feel like a lot of this stuff is really going to help and you're going to be able to implement this in whatever process, you know, like I already mentioned, your onboarding journey looks like. And then hopefully this will make a more accurate scope for you. You'll be able to get the projects done on time. You'll be building properly for it. And hopefully it just makes your, you know, website design journey a bit more simple. If you guys have any questions, thoughts, comments, please do post them in the YouTube comments below. Next up, I wanna cover pricing, then possibly customer onboarding. I don't really know exactly what's next, but hopefully this is something you guys are interested in. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in a future video.